Okay, so hi everyone, thank you for coming. I am Georgios, I work with Loom and my focus is primarily in the domain of security and scalability in the Ethereum platform. Uh, with uh, Loom Network, we have built uh, Crypto Zombies, the first, uh, the biggest uh, school for learning Solidity. We also have built um, Zombie Battleground, a game for playing uh, cards like Hearthstone, for example, uh, that lives on a blockchain. And currently, we're building a so-called platform so for social and game apps called uh, Dapp Chains which are secured by a so-called technique of plasma. So this talk will be focused on this. So firstly, uh, most of you are probably familiar with the reasons. So firstly, why do we want blockchain games? We have the true ownership of game assets, like so self-sovereign money. Nobody can take it from you, even if the actual game shuts down. We have open data, so we can have a crypto kitty. We can maybe burn it or something, and we can get something on another game. We have uh, forkable, so if the company starts censoring the DAP, we can just go to some other DAP and we're good. And also it enables new business models to monetize all these apps. However, there is the obvious problem that currently Bitcoin is at seven transactions per second with one megabyte blocks. Ethereum currently at one mil nine million gas can handle about 28, maybe 30 transactions per second. And if you want to do smart contracts, it's even less. The options, firstly, okay, we have centralized solutions, but we don't care about that. We have sharding, which may take a while, maybe the new SAS pair proposal, it's due 2020. We have other architectures, we can go to towards EOS or IOTA, but I won't comment on that. And then we have off-chain scalability options, which is the focus of today. And we have side chains and plasma, and we also have channels, which I believe there is another talk on channels, so I will not talk about that. So firstly, on on sidechains, we have uh, the very first basic model of a sidechain, of a two-way pegged sidechain, was broaded in 2014 by Adam Back from Blockstream, and uh, it involved basically that you have some uh, currency on one chain and some on another. If you prove that you locked it on the sending chain, some th at some point, uh, the equivalent of that money gets created on the other chain. And you can transact freely with it on the other chain, and at some point, then you can opt to like burn it on the side chain, and then get it back on the original chain. And this is the original model, which is known for a while. However, it's not very practical at times, because if the consensus mechanism of the side chain fails, namely Ethereum in this case, but if we want more scalability, we'll have something else, it can become problematic. So this is where Plasma comes in. And Plasma is a technique which allows for gains similar to what the sidechain gives. However, it gives us different security guarantees. So firstly, a plasma chain is a blockchain which runs its own consensus algorithm. It can be DPoS, proof of authority, you name it. Uh, and what happens is that instead of having the usual blocks, we have plasma blocks which follow a certain uh, structure. So I would assume that the audience is familiar with the Merkle trees. If not, it's a technique basically where we take the hashes of all the transactions, we put them in a certain structure, and we essentially take an identifier that can be used to prove various things very efficiently. And what happens is that we take the whole transactions in a, in a block, we Merkleize them, and that gets submitted to a Plasma contract. Whereby a Plasma contract, it's just an Ethereum Solidity smart contract, or Viper if you're more fancy. And uh, it actually has a sort of event function whereby whenever you make a deposit on it, some uh, event gets emitted and the side chain listens to it and uh, the plasma chain listens to it and it creates a new block. And also, it is very responsible, it implements some sort of a game where, game by not as blockchain game, it's like a crypto economic game, where there are the exits and the challenges. And I'll get into that soon. At this point, I want to focus that Plasma is a design technique. Many companies are building on Plasma, there are many variations of Plasma, so we shouldn't focus on like that Plasma, there is one real Plasma, Plasma Cache is the real Plasma. It's just anything that you want to be, it just has to follow the certain rules, that you Merkleize the transactions and you implement a specific on-chain exit game. And so the thing is that the original Plasma proposal in August 2017, if I'm not mistaken, almost a year ago, it had some, uh, it was pretty impractical, it was quite complex. After a while, Plasma MVP came out, which had, which was a certain like simplified version of it. However, it wasn't good enough for what we wanted because it requires a sort of, uh, its security guarantees are kind of harder to achieve. And so some months ago in March, if I'm not mistaken, Vitalik Buterin came up with Plasma Cash 
whereby Plasma Cash, it's like cash, so each coin that you deposit on Plasma, it gets its own unique ID. So if I deposit Ethereum, it gets some serial number, 0x1 in this case. If I deposit some other token, it gets that. If I deposit the CryptoKitty, it gets that. It doesn't have to be specific to a standard. It can be ERC721, can be whatever you like. However you code the contract, it's a, it's a design pattern, as I said. And what this allows us is that because each token is unique, we can have a very much easier exit game. And by exit game, I define the process by which a user, after they have deposited their funds on the Plasma chain, it's their intent to withdraw it back to the original chain. Ethereum, in our case, that would be. So let's take the usual suspect, Alice. So let's say that Alice deposits her five Ether. She takes it. She puts it in the Plasma contract by the fallback function or whatever. The Plasma contract emits a deposit. Inside the function, it calculates the serial number of the coin. It can be through any kind of function, depending on what you want. And uh, the Plasma chain, in turn, it will create a new Plasma block, giving crediting Alice with a Plasma 5 Plasma Ether bill. And transactions in this kind of format, they happen just like cash. I give Bob, Alice gives Bob this currency, and they're good. But there is no... There is no concept of divisibility. So if I have a 5 Ether coin, I cannot split it into smaller amounts. And we'll talk about that in the end, about how it can be a problem, but how it can also be solved. And so let's go through the process of how would the plasma transfer be. So at this point, I have depos Alice has deposited her coin. And at block 1, for example, she owns the coin. She wants to do something with it. She gives it to Bob. And at this point, the security model of Plasma Cash, it requires that the users, they must always verify the history of the coin that they're receiving. Where by history, I mean that every time I receive a coin, I need to go through the start of whenever it was deposited and verify that the medical proofs of it were actually valid. And if they were, I can accept it. I will tell the sender if it's a vendor transaction, OK, I accept your coin, take my product. And in this case, let's say that Bob now has the coin, block three comes, gets submitted where it has some other transactions, perhaps not related to Alice's coin, not related to the coin in question. Nothing happens, we're good. So in this case, if Bob wants to give the coin to Charlie, he actually, uh, Charlie must verify that the coin was correctly included in block one, in block two, and they must also verify that the coin was not included in block three. Because obviously, if Bob also included the coin in block three and in block four, it is a double spend. And we want to avoid that. And so Charlie, now that they have uh, verified that the coin is valid, they can start an exit. And they can say that, OK, I exit. I received the coin at, at coin two at uh, block four. And uh, an ancestor is at block two. And uh, when exiting, the security requirements are that we also provide an ancestor of the, the first ancestor of our transaction in order to have like, a, a valid uh, exit game. It's part of the exit game, which maybe we can also talk about that later because we're quite limited in the time. And uh, so, OK, now Charlie has started the exit. So, so far we have gone over deposit. Transfer, now we want to withdraw the coins. We have, we're on the plasma chain. The plasma chain is very highly functional. It can do about, I don't know, 2,000 transactions maybe per second, maybe more. Depends on your capabilities. And what you do is that whenever you start an exit, you need to wait the so-called exit period, whereby T0 is the start, T2 is the end. And uh, in, the, in the middle, we have the, so the end, the, in between the two, we have the challenge and the response. So in the first half of the exit period, Somebody can make a dispute. Somebody can say, no, your exit was not valid. And if your exit was not valid, they do that by providing some Merkle proofs. It's on the next slide. So whenever you make an exit, you need to wait some time. In this uh, sense, it's very similar to real life. So you have, you have the police, whereby if you make a mistake, the police will come and punish you. So in this uh, model, instead of having the actual police, you have users who play that role. And so the whole process of uh, withdrawing a coin, it's actually, so whenever you make, you have a coin in the plasma chain, it's in the deposited state. When you make, when you want to exit it, you submit a start exit at the station, let's say, along with a security bond. And this is the bond that gets lost if your challenge, if your exit gets challenged. During the exiting state, if your coin is there, it can be challenged. It can be either challenged with a non-interactive challenge or with an interactive one. If it's a non-interactive one, the exit is gone. It's gone, you lost your money, you were a fraud. If it's an interactive one, 
if you recall in the previous slide, in, in, in the interactive challenge case, you have in the first half, it can be challenged. In the next half, it can be responded. And in order for an exit to be finalized, the, much, the exit period must pass, which is arbitrarily set to one week. And after that week has passed, if the exit has no outstanding challenges, so if it had any interactive challenges, all of this must be responded to, the exit gets finalized and it's good. So I will go over some of uh, the three basic challenges that we have currently, the three challenges that we can use to prevent fraud. In the first case, let's consider that Alice has the coin at block N. She gives the coin to, to Bob and she directly exits it. At this point, Alice has submitted an exit of a spent coin because she had it suspended as she tries to exit it at an earlier point. Bob is able to provide a Merkle proof that the coin was actually included at the next block and he is able to cancel Alice's exit and get the bond, which is very good because now Alice cannot defraud Bob. In this case, we're safe. In the other case, it is the one that I talked about before, that you can do a double spend. So for example, if Alice gives the coin to Bob and Alice gives the coin to Charlie and Charlie, Charlie tries to exit that coin by providing the ancestor as said before, which is here is why we need the ancestor, because at this point, Bob can challenge the double spend because he tran his transaction, he can prove that the transaction was included before. And this allows us to, again, uh, avoid fraud. In the final case, which is the, the interactive challenge, so the previous two challenges, they are instant, they are non-interactive. Whenever somebody is able to do them, the exit gets cancelled and that's it. In the interactive challenge case, it's slightly more complex. This one requires that the consensus mechanism of the plasma chain, it also becomes fraud. So it's a, it's a more complex case and that's why it requires a response. So let's say that Alice has the coin at block N and at some point, at some later block, somehow the, op the, the consensus mechanism decides to give Bob the coin. Why? Because the consensus mechanism is insecure, because the plasma chain is a fraud. It can be anything. It's not proof of work. Remember, it c fraud can happen in this case. But it's within our security model. And so Bob gives the coin to Charlie, Charlie gives the coin to Dylan, and now Dylan, for what it's worth, he should have checked the coin's history. And if the coin's history was valid, he would check that there is a transaction from Alice to Bob. But in this case, everybody's colluding to steal Alice's coin. And so what must happen here is that the moment Dylan exits, some, uh, Alice will challenge and she will say, no, my coin is valid, here it is. And in order for them to cancel Alice's challenge to the exit, they must respond. With a, whereby the response, it will be a spend from Alice to Bob. However, if they cannot prove that there was a spend from Alice to Bob, well, there wasn't in this case, that the challenge is valid and the exit will get cancelled. So I hope it's clear how this mechanism works. It's the three simplest mechanisms of, uh, that we have currently in the challenge mechanism. But there is the thing, so how can we do better? Because there are some issues with uh, Plasma Cache right now. So firstly, we can utilize sparse Merkle trees. So sparse Merkle trees, they have some nice properties that uh, perhaps um, I will not go very much into depth. They just, they allow us, um, they allow us to make Merkle proofs much shorter. So normally a Merkle proof is like 32 bytes for multiplied by the number of uh, leaves that you need, uh, the number of siblings that you need to provide. However, in this case, we can do some uh, caching and pre-compute the default values of the Merkle tree. And in this case, we can avoid, uh, instead of like having, in this example, two 32-byte proofs, if it is two default leaves, we can have like two bits, which is very helpful. And these are the research posts from ETH Research. So, as I said before, when making, when receiving a coin, users need to verify the coin's history. And this may sound like it's okay, but really it's not, because if you have a plasma chain that goes on for one year, the data requirements for a user to verify, they're about two gigabytes. And this means that whenever a user needs to send a coin to another user, the receiver needs to download one or two gigabytes after this time has passed for each coin which is quite a pain in the ass. So what we want to do is that we can use checkpoints, for example. So by checkpoints, which was first described by Kelvin Hitter, um, by checkpoints, instead of having to verify since the coin's history, what we can do, it's, uh, let's say every 10,000 blocks, we can make a checkpoint, and we need to verify only up to the latest checkpoint. However, this introduces some protocol complexities which are currently under research. 
Another alternative that we can do, which is proposed by Joseph Poon, author of the Plasma Paper and the Lightning Network, is that we can make less frequent commitments to the main network, because if I recall what I said in the beginning, is that the, pla the Plasma chain, it makes commitments to the Plasma contract. These commitments, they, normally they should happen every block. And if they happen very often, it is to increase throughput. However, if we make them less often, what, we can do that. However, we lose throughput. So the challenge here is to not lose finality and throughput. And the last, which is the fanciest, let's say, um, solution that we can give in this case, is to basically use either Bloom filters or fancy cryptography to avoid having to do some of these uh, proofs in a shorter amount of time. Another issue is that because Plasma coins in uh, Plasma Cash, they're non-fungible, so whenever I make a deposit of 5 Ether, it's 5 Ether. I cannot split it in any way. I can only give it, give it to somebody else. What would be nice is that, and this is a problem, because if I have a 7 Ether coin and I want to pay for 5, I need to somehow get 2 in 2 as an exchange. However, there is the challenge here that this needs to be atomic. So the moment I send 7 to the receiver, I must also be sure that I receive 2. And this is also currently my open research. This is all future work that I'm talking about. The other uh, option is arbitrary denomination payment. So essentially, we can think of that the plasma coin, instead of having being like a five ether coin, it can have any amount between zero and five. And we can use that to make, to make essentially build payment channels on top of plasma cash, which is a very interesting aspect. And there is a very recent proposal by Vitalik Baterin, on, which is called the plasma cash defragmentation whereby instead of depositing a 5 Ether coin, whenever I deposit the 5 Ether coin, I get 100 of 0.05 Ether coins. And I can spend then smaller denominations of that to somebody else. And I can also rearrange some uh, parts of the coins in order to have smaller Merkle proofs. The final one that we need to solve is fast withdrawals and optimistic exits. So as I said earlier, whenever I make an exit, I need to wait seven days. And from a UX perspective, that sucks. So what we want to do is to somehow make it so that we tokenize the exit. So whenever I make an exit request that says that I, I want to exit this 5 Ether coin and I am willing to wait seven days, some other party can come, to say, can come and buy my exit for some amount. And it can be expected that this party will pay a smaller amount because they satisfy my, low time, my high time preference. So what will happen is that if I want to get my coin right now, I'm willing to pay my, if I'm willing to get my 5 Ether coin right now, I'm willing to pay some, like, one dollar more, one euro more, to get that exit right now, instead of having to settle this in one week. And uh, this is essentially the providers who will be buying these exits, they're the liquidity providers. And the other assumption is that in order to make exits currently, we need to provide a bunch of proofs, which is, again, it's a pain. So what we can do is that we assume that exits we are optimistic, they are valid in the first place, but we need to add one more challenge. So essentially, whenever we want to reduce data, we defer essentially the validation of the data with the challenge. And this is the tricky part of designing a correct plasma construction, because how do you know that the challenge will actually be valid? And this is where tools such as formal verification come into play. So some final notes on this. Plasma does not actually improve finality, which is not very well understood across the community. So a transaction on plasma it's considered finalized only after the block that it was included in gets committed in the, in the blockchain. And at the same time, the witness data, the Merkle proofs for this coin, they need to be made available to everyone. As long as this doesn't happen, the transaction cannot be considered finalized. But it improves capacity. And with capacity comes throughput, because instead of having to settle about 30 transactions, multiply, I don't know how many transactions fit in 9 million gas, Instead, what we can do is that we can field an arbitrarily big amount of transaction and we can compress it in one Merkle root. And this one Merkle root effectively allows us to settle all these transactions, which is a very helpful um, result. And I like to think of Plasma as a compression mechanism to settle more transactions per block. So thank you very much for your attention. And this was my short, slightly technical presentation on Plasma. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and you can see our repository on uh, GitHub. Thank you.